Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa Hirai Suchitani, and I am very honored to serve as chair of the board of directors for the Japanese American Women Alumni of UC Berkeley. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon uh, for our special 31st annual awards event. Uh, there has been much to reflect upon and mourn since the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus a pandemic one year ago. COVID-19 and the rise in anti-Asian violence and, and hate since its onset have disrupted the ways in which we have understood and experienced every facet of our lives. Despite the uncertainties and challenges of this past year, however, I have found great inspiration in the courage compassion and creativity of our current and future leaders, uh, some of whom we will be hearing from today. I also remain deeply appreciative of the steadfast dedication of my colleagues who serve with me on the board of directors for the Japanese American Women Alumni of UC Berkeley, um, who have continued to further the gracious resilience upon which our chapter was founded, um, especially over the course of this past year. Uh, thanks to, our, to their efforts, we've been able to continue the work of Jawa UCB, uh, which has included transitioning our quarterly in-person board meetings to a Zoom remote format um, on a bi-monthly basis, redesigning our soon-to-be-published website, publishing an inaugural newsletter um, that's electronic, uh, and lastly, embarking upon a strategic planning process to better serve our campus and alumni communities. As a chartered club of the California Alumni Association founded in 1992, the mission of Jawa UCB is to quote, inspire and support Asian American women as leaders, learners and contributors to local and global communities in the spirit of our founding Japanese American women alumni. Thank you for joining us this afternoon to honor the historical legacy of Japanese American women at Cal who have made our scholarship program and our chapter possible. At this time, I would like to introduce Amanda Pouchot, president of the board of directors of the California Alumni Association for a few words of welcome. A 2008 sociology graduate of UC Berkeley, Amanda is currently the president of Jim Buddy's Protein Donuts. She began her career at McKinsey and Company in New York City and previously co-founded LEVO, a career networking platform for millennial women. She has served as chair of her fifth and 10th year UC Berkeley class reunions and was a member of the launch team for Cheryl Sandberg's Lean In. While at UC Berkeley, Amanda was the 2008 Cal Greeks and Order of Omega Woman of the Year, a chronicler in the Order of the Golden Bear, Panhellenic Executive Vice President, Panhellenic Director of Programming, and a CAA alumni scholar. Please join us, uh, join me in welcoming Amanda. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today and really just can't express my gratitude enough for such a kind introduction and to all of your dedication, to everyone that's here, to your dedication to Cal and our alumni communities and specifically the community that you've built as Japanese women alumni of UC Berkeley. I wanna first begin by sharing a piece of, this, of CAA's statement condemning the rise in anti-Asian violence. We are painfully aware that these events are simply the most recent wounds that deep systemic racism has inflicted on our nation. As leaders and members of UC Berkeley's alumni community, we condemn the violent acts committed by, against Asians, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders in Georgia, in our Berkeley and Bay Area communities and beyond. The Cal Alumni Association stands with the university in supporting our Asian, Asian American, and Pacific Islander community members and denouncing all hateful acts of violence and an active pursuit of a just and equitable world for all who inhabit it. I often hear from alumni about the different transformations they went through while a student at Cal and how significant our diverse community of students, staff and alumni shaped their worldviews. For me personally, and like many of you, Cal was that opportunity for me to grow, not just academically, but as a whole human being. And I am so grateful for the role our alumni play in helping make Cal more accessible to all students. As a scholarship recipient and now a scholarship donor, I am constantly moved by the resilience and drive in our students and how significant a role these scholarships play 
and helping our students succeed on campus. I want to specifically highlight the 160 undergraduate scholarships and 70 graduate scholarships your community has given. So again, thank you to all of you for your incredible support of our students and our alumni. I'm really excited to be here today to honor the legacy of Japanese women, American women at UC Berkeley and also recognize the accomplishments of your 2021 undergraduate scholarship recipients and your, your and graduate scholarship recipients and outstanding alumni of the year. I also am very excited to hear from your keynote speaker, especially with what's going on in the world today. Thank you to your club leadership for putting on such a wonderful digital event. I know this past year it has really been our communities and our volunteer leaders that have brought us together and made us even stronger. I look forward to the day where we can all meet again in person, but for now, this is absolutely just wonderful. And again, so grateful for all the organization and work that your chapter has done and your leadership. Go Bears! Thank you so much for your kind words, Amanda, and, and thank you and your staff for being here as well. We greatly appreciate your support. Uh, now I'd like to introduce board members, Dr. Joyce, his, Joyce Takahashi, our historian, Leslie Tsukamoto, corresponding secretary, and Nancy Arata Fong, our treasurer for the business portion of our event. This is a brief history of the Japanese American women alumni of UC Berkeley. And there are more details uh, at the website and also in a monograph that you can obtain um, through the website through corresponding with us. In the 1920s and 30s, Japanese American women and all people of color studying at UC Berkeley faced racial discrimination in housing. However, in the fall of 1937, following a decade of fundraising within the Japanese American community, Seven co-eds and their house mothers moved into the newly purchased five bedroom Japanese Women's Students Clubhouse on 2509 Hearst Avenue. It's no longer there, it's a food court there if you're gonna look it up. However, in the 1940s, following Executive Order 9066, there was a five year hiatus due to wartime exclusion. During World War II, the house was rented out after resettlement, the house was again a common meeting place on campus for Nikkei students, such as myself. Before the 1960s, UC Berkeley was offering racially integrated co-ops and dormitories. So that in Janu on January 10th, 1967, the Japanese clubhouse was sold for $72,000. Proceeds from the sale were given by the Nisei Board of Directors to the UC Regents for the Japanese American Women Alumni Scholarship Fund. The fund has continued to grow with the generosity of families and friends. In 1991, the alumni began a series of annual luncheons to honor the scholarship recipients and all Asian American women. And that's a brief history of our club, thank you. Uh, thank you, Joyce. Um, as the nominations chair, um, I'd just like to acknowledge that how proud we are of the wonderful women that volunteer to serve on our board and we're most appreciative of their time and their talents. Before I announce the results of our 2021 election, I'd like to express our appreciation to our outgoing chair, Lisa Hirai Tsuchitani, who has done, an, I think, an, just an outstanding job during these last two years. Accomplishing all we have, mostly by Zoom, has been a real tribute to her leadership. Um, also, a thank you to our outgoing uh, recording secretary, Carol Tateshi, for her timely and accurate minutes. On to the results of the election. Uh, thank you to the members that responded to our online doodle ballot. We had no nominations from the floor, and by unanimous approval, the new officers for the 2021 to 23 term are going to be Grace Morizella as our chair. Stacy Kono as our vice chair, 
and Kay Yutabe as our recording secretary. We're also very honored to have approval for two new directors that will be serving four-year terms, Janice Koyama and Shirley Muramoto. We look forward to having uh, everyone have the opportunity to meet them in person at our 2022 luncheon. So thank you to all. And um, our next presenter will be Nancy who will give our financial report. Hi, good afternoon. Um, before I give the treasurer's report, I just want to say a few words in remembrance um, of my predecessor, Irene Takawa. Um, unfortunately, Irene had passed in October 2020 um, after our last event, and she would be missed by all of us. Um, she was the Jawa UCB treasurer from 2013 through 2020. Um, and before that, she had served as co-chair. Um, she was a great friend to all of us, and we will dearly miss her. Um, just to go on to the financial report, this is um, for seven months. Um, this is going from the ending date of our last report from August 31st through March 31st of this year. And we had a big beginning balance of $15,643. And we had total receipts of $3,030 from our membership dues, donations to JAWA and grants. Total disbursements of $1,332. Um, expenses from our last October's event um, and for this current event for memorials and administrative expenses. So we had a net increase of $1,697 and with an ending balance of $17,341. And we're thankful for your support and membership and in donations. So thank you. Um, I also just want to acknowledge um, <clears throat> donors to our scholarship fund. And I think we have a list of their names in the next slide. So thank you very much for your support for the scholarship fund so we can um, continue to be supporting students. So thank you very much for your support. Thank you so much, Joyce, Leslie, and Nancy. I am honored to introduce the recipient of our 2021 Outstanding Alumna Award, Chizu Omori. A self-described political activist, Chizu attended UC Berkeley in the 1950s, where she became active in the civil rights movement and has never quit. Old enough to remember her family's incarceration at Poston, Arizona, she was involved in the redress movement and was named a plaintiff in the William Horry class action suit that went to the Supreme Court. With her sister, Emiko, she is the co-producer of the documentary, Rabbit in the Moon an award-winning selection at the 1999 Sundance Film Festival that chronicles the varied history of political tensions, social and generational divisions, and resistance and collaboration within the Japanese American community as a result of their incarceration in US concentration camps during World War II. A 2020 recipient of the Dr. Clifford I. Ueda Peace and Humanitarian Award, Kizu was a columnist for the Nichi Bay Weekly and an active member of Sudu for Solidarity. Every Friday, she and her sister hold a, hold a vigil where she holds a sign that says, quote, yellow power for black lives matter. Please join me in welcoming Chizu Omori. Oh, yeah. uh, well, uh, I'd like to say thank you to all the um, members of the uh, organization that selected me. And I, I really honestly can't understand why I was selected, but I feel very honored for, uh, for this, uh, this uh, opportunity to speak before you. Um, I must say that um, going to Berkeley was something that changed my life. And uh, I think that, uh, if it hadn't been for Berkeley, I don't know how, you know, my life may not have taken this turn, but I got very interested in politics while at Berkeley. 
this was during the 50s, during the McCarthy era. And uh, after uh, graduating from Berkeley, uh, I stayed in this area and continued to be a civil rights and political activist. And um, I must say that it's wonderful to know that there are so many Japanese American women who did go to Berkeley and we form a very strong sisterhood. And um, I am so proud to be uh, a member of this sisterhood. Um, I'd like to say that we are in turbulent times today. I feel that uh, it's more important than ever to be, be a political activist, to be part of the um, concerned citizens due to the anti-Asian violence and uh, the problems that we have in our country. And I feel very strongly that racism is still the basic problem that we face in our country. So I hope to continue to be active and to be fighting for all minority rights in the US. So thanks a lot. And I'm very happy and I'm, um, I have this nice little pin to show that I <laughs> received this honor. Thanks a lot. Yay, Shizu! <laughs> My friends. <laughs> That's a big bottle, Shizu. What is that a bottle of? Is that champagne? Oh, or champagne? Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. <laughs> Okay. We're all celebrating you. Thank you so much again for, for the legacy of work that you have left us. Um, well, I feel so grateful to you all. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you. At this time, I would like to introduce Barbara Kawamoto, our scholarship chair, who will be introducing our 2020-2021 undergraduate and graduate scholarship recipients. Barbara? Hey, thanks, Lisa, and thank you, Chizu, for sharing your remarkable story. Well, are you guys ready for um, to get even more inspired? In a minute, we're going to hear from our amazing uh, Cal Jawa UCB scholarship recipients and their amazing journeys. They represent a wide range of majors, English, theater, performance we'll study, down there. molecular, and cell biology, economics, and comparative literature. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first scholar who's been feeling the warmth of the Cal community during COVID. It's Kayla Kohn Uemura. Kayla? Hello. Um, I just wanna start out by saying I am so grateful and humbled to be in this space with all of you. This is such a high honor and I'm very, very grateful. Um, I came to Cal four years ago. I have been majoring in English and theater. Um, and I think that those two majors have sort of shaped a lot of my undergrad career here. I've spent time working with Berkeley Fiction Review as an editor. Um, and then a lot of my outside time I've devoted to musical theater through Bear Stage Productions, which is a student run organization here on campus. Um, and these past couple of years, we did a production of Next to Normal, which I was Diana Goodman in. And then we also did a like musical mystery that was called Curtains the Musical, which um, was very fun. So theater has definitely shaped a lot of my life here at Cal. Um, and then I've also had the privilege of working closely with Professor Philip Congatonda um, because I'm very interested in playwriting and musical writing. So after graduation, I will be moving down to Southern California to go to graduate school at the California Institute of the Arts, where I will be pursuing an MFA in acting. And I hope to continue writing stories to uplift and represent Japanese American women and families. Um, and I am very interested in immersive theater as a form to explore multi-generational stories. So I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla. I can't wait to see you in the movies someday. 
Our next scholar is enthusiastic about several opportunities, including cognitive neuroscience research and a lot more. So I'm pleased to um, have here Sheena Horiki. Hi everyone. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Hi everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me today. I'm so honored to be here. Um, I am, or like as Barbara mentioned, I am a graduating fourth year, um, majoring in molecular and cell biology with an interest in neurobiology. Um, after graduating, I'm I'll be applying to medical school and in my gap year, I'm planning to work in a healthcare setting or become involved in clinical research. Um, during my time at Cal, um, the scholarship has really supported me in pursuing my career goals as well as my interests. Um, I was involved in um, a student organization called the Music Connection where you teach young, uh, where we offer free music tutoring for young students in the area. And I've also been involved in cognitive, in a cognitive neuroscience lab. Um, and I had the opportunity to work on an honors thesis this year um, about brain network reorganization after brain injury. Um, so that's been a really exciting project and they'll be available online. So very excited um, to share about our findings. Um, so yes, I'm so honored to be here today and thank you so much. Thank you, Sheena. It's so great to have you here. And you know what? The best doctors are the women doctors. That's my personal experience as well. So our next scholar is reconnecting with her Japanese roots at Cal, and she's going to soon launch her career on the East Coast. Let's hear it now from Riley Odom. Riley. Hi. <laughs> I apologize if you can hear the wind behind me, but I really just wanted to be here. So um, this is the only thing that worked out for me. But I want to start off by saying thank you to everybody for being a supporter in my career and my education. I grew up in Montana, and it's 97% white. And so it's very disconnected from my Japanese side. And here at Cal, I just had four years of amazing reconnections. I studied abroad in Japan and it's just been beautiful. And I'm very grateful and very thankful for uh, the past four years. But yeah, I'm very passionate about my economics major. I did a labor market discrimination project where we were looking at the difference of applications and how hard it is to get a job between ethnicity. So it's very, very interesting and I'm very grateful to be part of that project. And from here on out, I'm moving to New York City and going to finance. So it's been wonderful. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Riley. All right, and we're going to close off with our fourth scholar. She's pursuing a PhD in Complet, and she has had a lifelong passion for languages and so much more. We're ready to hear from you, Madeline. This is Madeline Zimring. Thanks, Madeline. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And it really is so inspiring to hear about everybody's impressive work and their, their sort of journeys of getting here. But um, yeah, so I'm a first year PhD student in the comparative literature department. And I work mainly on French, German, and Italian literature. And I actually graduated from the same department in 2017. So I am very familiar with Berkeley and I, I love it so much. I'm really grateful to be here again um, for seven more years. Um, and in undergrad, I worked on um, language violence and resistance in contemporary French and German refugee literature. And since then I spent two years teaching English and literary translation in Paris and Grenoble, France and completed a master's in modern languages at Oxford. Um, and so I'm really just so yeah, grateful and excited to continue pursuing my research on refugee literature and poetry with Professor Debardi Sagnol here in the French department. Um, and I'm really hoping to get reinvolved in some of the sort of activities that I did in undergrad. One of the main ones um, was I sort of worked as an interpreter and a volunteer at the East Bay Sanctuary Covenant for French speaking asylum seekers. Um, and it's kind of hard to think about the <laughs> 
you know, post doctorate at this point, because I still have a long way to go, but I'm hoping eventually to work as a translator or an interpreter um, and or to just continue to teach languages, um, you know, at a community college for your university. I'm not sure yet, but teaching is one of my passions as well. So I'm so grateful and thankful for um, the Japanese American Women's Alumni Association here um, for, for your generous support and helping me to achieve this goal. So thank you so much. Thank you, Madeline, and all of you. Let's hear it for them. Thank you, guys. Sorry, wish I'm, you all the best. I'm going to take a picture of all of you. So if you want to pose, I'm going to do a little screenshot. So let me just step inside. Thanks for your patience. All right, I think I got it. How about one more round of applause for all of our outstanding um, undergraduate and graduate scholarship recipients, as well as our outstanding alumna, Chizu Omori. Um, I think finding moments of joy, especially remotely during a pandemic are so important. And uh, we're really, really proud of all of you and, and grateful for your continued leadership. Well, with that, um, I have the great pleasure at this point of introducing yet another leader um, who for over 40 years has been a, a leading proponent for underserved communities in the fight for healthcare as a right, not a privilege, Sherry Hirota. The Chief Executive Officer of Asian Health Services and Co-Chair of the One Nation Commission, Sherry has led movements to lift and center the voices and needs of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders to expand healthcare access, education, and linguistic and cultural competency. She was the first to champion the importance of understanding the beneficial role that immigrants play in insurance pools and coverage, advocating for the first ever quality quality data collection and analysis of health disparities within the AAPI community. She also has been instrumental in forging coalitions and partnerships with multi-ethnic, multi-racial, disabled, and LGBTQ advocates to develop and advance common agendas in service to all communities. Her talk today is entitled Leadership, Advocacy and API Health Access in a Time of COVID-19 and Racism. Please join me in welcoming Sherry Hirota. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to start off by saying congratulations to Chizu Omori. You know, you are a role model for all of us. And so this is really great to be uh, honored uh, or giving the keynote today uh, when you are being honored. So uh, much in awe of all of your accomplishments and those that are to come. Uh, thank you, Lisa. I'm honored and humbled to speak here today. And as I reflected on the history of the Japanese American women's alumni of UC Berkeley, I felt it was important to start off uh, with taking some passages from my mother's memoirs. My mother, uh, Hisako Jun Kurewa, was a Nisei born in 1923 in Stockton. Her parents were farm workers initially. They moved to Berkeley, uh, 2018 Blake Street, uh, where they lived until of evacuation. And growing up, she attended Japanese school. Our Japanese school, she said, was a very good but strict uh, school, and we learned a lot. I found Japanese school easy, and while waiting for the boys in our class to catch up, I would work on my homework. So by the time I got home, my homework was finished. So we went, she said, six days a week, every day after school, and on Saturday mornings. At the Berkeley Buddhist Church, she said, although the membership was not that large, our Sunday school had many people attending who went to Cal from various parts of California. My mom also said, I had done very well scholastically, but my father didn't want me to go to college. He said it was not necessary for girls to go. Our neighbor, she said, Mrs. Sajimori did not believe that. And she kept after my mother to let me go to college, at least to business school. So I got to go to Armstrong Business College, she said, where I excelled in every advanced class. So I would say my mother was so very smart and I imagine how far she would have gone with a college education. 
how fitting it is to be part of this annual event, which grew out of the two-story house at 2509 Hearst Street and a subsequent scholarship fund. I thank all of you for this important work, making sure women have a chance to get a college education. So I said at the beginning of this remarks, how humbled I am to speak to you today. I do it because of my passion for the work, the importance of the issues of language access and affordable health care, and because we can all use more role models for Japanese American, Asian American, Pacific Islander American, and women of color leadership. My story, to the chagrin of my parents, did not follow the path they intended. I grew up in Berkeley, and by high school in the late 60s, the community was very politicized. So I cringe at the name Yellow Student Union, uh, which is in the article uh, displayed here, that we formed at Berkeley High. I later chose uh, San Francisco State because of the activism and action was so vibrant there. So the first day at San Francisco State, I was told by my told that my sole career aspiration as a teacher was a dead end and that I should look for uh, something else to do with my life. So I ended up taking a nine unit community organizing course led by Neil Gotanda, brother of Philip Gotanda, held at San Francisco's Japantown. And he was so effective that after one year I dropped out of college altogether and I moved to LA to organize full time. My mom recounts in her memoirs, although we pleaded with her to finish college first, her story is one of determination, guts, persistence, and a firm belief in her ability. And I am so proud of what she's accomplished. Phew, there is nothing like guilt from your parents. <laughs> so I came to Asian Health Services in 1976 as a patient. I soon found my dream job as office manager and with this mission driven health clinic, um, my organizing experience was able to really come in handy, I felt. Um, the organization was founded to address the real and concrete needs in Oakland Chinatown. Language barriers and the lack of affordable health care prevented the residents from obtaining care. The idealism and political advocacy came from the students, many from UC Berkeley and the community activists to build on the practical and needed services uh, for the community. And it was believed that a movement changed values and empowered people was very important part of that process of providing services. And this is a quote from Don Tamaki, who many of you may know, and it's part of our Asian Health Services story. So 40 something years later, Asian Health Services is a $60 million a year federally qualified health center. We have, all, we have 500 staff, 50,000 patients speaking 15 different languages. We have services, medical, dental, mental health, community outreach and advocacy with a national reputation and reach for innovation and policy impact. Some of you may recognize the Silver Dragon restaurant uh, this is one of our clinic sites where many of us have held our funeral and wedding banquets over the years. Um, with the support of the Chi family, it is one of our uh, many successful uh, sites in Alameda County. So next slide. Fast forward, it is almost as if the community went underground in 2020, facing the perfect storm of immigrant bashing, COVID-19 and anti-Asian attacks. We had been organizing around the anti-immigrant policies of the Trump administration, particularly public charge for three years. It had singled out legal immigrants, the majority of whom are Asian and threatened to deport, punish or prohibit them from using public services like healthcare, food relief or housing. And what was perhaps more insidious than simply withholding benefits was the narrative that accompanied public charge, that Asian immigrants are why Americans are out of work, cried Attorney General Jeff Sessions and top White House advisor Steve Bannon. 
The message was so alarming and chilling. I mean, it was so close to the same um, remarks that the killers of Vincent Chin said, that it was the Japanese or it was, you know, a Asians who uh, were why they were out of work in the, in the car factories. So Asian anti-Asian hate has continued in this last period to bubble up in the American consciousness. By January, 2020, Chinatown restaurants were the first to close. People masked up and somehow the community knew to shelter in place before shelter in place was declared across the state and our nation. It was eerie and perhaps there was a sense that anti-Asian hate was festering and that we could sense a rise in violence against Asians. I remember that time, a car, during that time, a car rammed into a Chinatown storefront and an Asian woman was pushed onto the BART tracks here at the Lake Merritt BART station. Spitting and coughing and racist taunting occurred too often during these last two years. And we are fortunate that the community has, beginning, has begun documenting anti-race crimes across the country. The risk of a going underground has been potentially linked to a higher death rate amongst Asian Americans from, from COVID-19. But when the Asian American experience and data was not being covered by the national press and by our um, health experts across the country, it took a renowned group of Asian American researchers independently to discover that Asians had an 8.1% fatality rate from COVID-19 versus 3.9 for the general population. A high mortality rate amongst Asian Americans means that either there isn't enough testing or people are waiting too long to get care, both suggesting a lack of access to care. So hearing from hundreds of our patients who shared stories of their challenges, Asian Health Services decided to conduct a COVID survey in June of 2020. We found that only 3% were getting tested compared to over 10% of the rest of the county, likely due to language barriers and fears. 73% surveyed were not, were afraid to leave their homes and 25% were feeling depressed. This data confirmed what we knew what was happening in our communities. Asians were being targeted, suffering economically, going underground, not able to get services they need, and suffering mentally from the pandemic. So to put it bluntly, we were being blamed and ignored. Our response is to break down these barriers to no longer be complicit in the false narrative of the model minority. If there is something to be hopeful about, it is that the community has rallied and the outpouring of rage and grief is beyond anything we've seen in the Asian American community in a very long time. We've been organized at the polls. We've documented over 3000 hate crimes collectively across the nation. Uh, we have stood in defense of our elderly uh, we've been holding rallies and the social media has become our platform. Our stories, our celebrities, our political leaders, our social influencers. What One Nation co-chairs, Congressman Mike Honda and myself issued a statement recently. We asked ourselves, why now? Why are we finally in the national spotlight after decades of being neglected? It is because we all know someone who's been spat upon, coughed on, and called racist names. Viral videos of slashed face, faces, black eyes, and then the Atlantic tragedies. So we are speaking out. We are organizing, working together with our diverse communities and allies to stop the hate, to change the broken systems and the culture of racism, hate, and violence that has brought us to this point. We do this with a deep understanding of commitment to solidarity work. The divisiveness and misinformation polluting our country has set us back decades in race relations. We must deal with and learn to talk openly about interracial conflict and redirect ourselves away from the zero sum mentality, which has its roots in white supremacy. 
There is the, the Stop API Hate Org website, which tracks and responds to incidences of hate, violence, harassment against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the United States. Along those lines, we have a website, Asian American Voices. It's very new, being launched.org. It's my language, my right. The new website is a new effort to collect data where meaningful language assistance is not provided. So the end game is understanding and putting each of our actions, organizing and contributions into a multi-level, multi-pronged movement strategy for human rights. We cannot do this alone. There are coalitions, organizations, leaders, individuals that are part of a larger power strategy, a, a power map that we you know, sort of have attempted to try to capture. So I would like to end with a quote from one of my favorite authors, Viet Nguyen. We don't succeed or fail because of fortune or luck. We succeed because we understand the way the world works and what we have to do. So with that, I thank the alumni for this opportunity. And I know my mom is cheering us on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sherry, for your, your inspiring and um, gracious words. Uh, yes, I, I feel your mother's spirit in, in all that you are doing and, and am grateful that you um, have invoked her spirit <laughs> with us today. Um, you know, we are running a little bit ahead of schedule. We had not scheduled a Q&A with you, but there are a few folks who have been chatting me privately and, and wanting to ask you a few burning questions. Would you entertain like maybe one or two questions from, um, from our, our, our attendees today before we, we close the meeting? <laughs> Only if you'll forgive me if I don't have all the answers, so. One of the things that I really enjoy the most about our alumni chapter is its multi-generational nature, right? Our board is very multi-generational. We are looking to support students at, at various phases in their academic journey based on our experiences as alum. And uh, I'm wondering if you, in the spirit of celebrating this multi-generational um, community we are currently in, um, if you would have any advice you would give to yourself, your younger self. Uh, <laughs> Finish college <laughs> first. Uh, no, I'm that. that's really a joke. I mean, I think there was something about how I um, approach learning uh, that, you know, has, uh, has worked out for myself and, and for the community and for my family. But um, I, I think that when you speak of generations, I think that uh, we all have a responsibility to, you know, bring up uh, and, and mentor the next generations and how wonderful it is that you use this vehicle as the storytelling from, you know, uh, what even um, got people uh, of Japanese American descent uh, women through college and where they've gone with that. And I think um, in again, referencing the, the power map and, and the many organizations that have been developed um, from the 60s, we are in a generational shift. I mean, uh, and we're handing it over. And I think our responsibility to where we have infrastructure like Asian Health Services at 60 million a year is to take that infrastructure and not just you know, blindly continue to provide services, but to utilize it as a platform by which we take new young um, medical students or public health um, students and really bring them into the fold and then provide that infrastructure so that they're able to contribute at their maximum back uh, to benefit the community. Thank you so much for that, Sherry. Uh, it looks like we might have time for one more question. Uh, and I think Adina is coaching people to raise their hand uh, using a Zoom hand. <laughs> I think it's a reactions button. Um, or you could just unmute and ask your question. Lorraine, did you have a question? Yes, I did. You know, I work for Apilo. I work for uh, Dean Ito Taylor. Yes, yes, and yes. if you want to answer this question, you can. If you don't, I totally <laughs> understand. 
but I know we're being affected, uh, funding is being affected. And I wanted to know, uh, you know, how you're doing. Uh, that's a really good question. And I would answer it um, in terms of the we with the many hats that I wear. And, and I think the best way to, to, to respond is to say that I, I believe that Asian American needs and voice is really um, making a breakthrough around the country. And as such, there are foundations that heretofore had not uh, supported a lot of Asian American uh, issues and organizations. And so I know just in this last two weeks, there have been, uh, there was um, the California Endowment is announced giving out a hundred million dollars over the next 10 years. So 10 million a year. Groups like Apilo would be certainly right in the sweet spot of the kinds of things that they uh, want to support so that our communities have a voice. And we, we at the clinic rely on Apilo uh, to provide so much assistance to our patients and community members who have difficulties with um, the challenges of the anti-immigrant um, laws that as the public charge and, and other issues of getting basic services. So um, thank you, Apilo. And, and I do have um, knowledge that there will be more um, foundation, Asian American foundation efforts um, that will be emerging. And I will happy to, I would be happy to share it with all of the organizations, including Apilo, um, because I think that uh, um, we, we are going to witness um, a lot of um, more responsiveness from the foundations and donors. And I think that that is much needed because your organizations have run on very tight shoestrings. Um, but thank you for uh, all of your work. Thank you very much for the answer. Please join me in thanking uh, Sherry Hirota again for an inspiring and inspired keynote address. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for having me. Of course. So this actually concludes our virtual celebration of our 2021 undergraduate and graduate scholarship recipients, Kayla Kohn Uemura, Sheena Horiki, Riley Odom, and Madeline Zering, as well as our standing alumna, Chizu Omori. A very special thank you again to Sherry Hirota for most timely and inspiring keynote address and Sarah Ying Runzenfell of Asian Health Services. Board President Amanda Pouchot, Executive Director Chloe Hewlett, and Director of Alumni Chapters Caitlin LaFleur. I think Antran also joined us. Um, they are all of the California Alumni Association. We greatly appreciate your continued support of our efforts. I want to thank as well the students from the UC Berkeley Nikkei Student Union uh, who were able to join us this afternoon. I, I recognize it's a very busy time of the semester with two weeks left before finals. Uh, thanks for being here with us. Uh, I also, of course, would like to acknowledge my colleagues, um, the Japanese American Women Alumni of UC Berkeley Board of Directors for your inspired leadership without which we, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. Um, a special thanks as well to Maya Garing harris of External Relations of the University of Development and Alumni, Alumni Relations Office. And lastly, um, I want to extend a very sincere thank you to all of you again for joining us on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, we greatly appreciate your continued support and engagement with the work that we do um, in support of our students, our future leaders. Uh, may you and your loved ones continue to be safe and well, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again, hopefully in person. Um, Fiat Lux and Go Bears, thanks again for joining us. <laughs>